Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. Say good morning to the world, Erica Gratton. Good morning, world. <laughs> it's morning for us, and um, our guest is just getting ready to get into his afternoon soon. Uh, today, I hope to have a wonderful show. I have some very, very uh, interesting stuff going on. Um, we're going to interview Craig Virgin, uh, what I would like to refer to as an American running legend, one of the greatest runners that ever came down the pipe in the United States. Um, you know, he, the beauty of this guy is, you know, first of all, I guess first and foremost is that we come from the same era. Actually, I'm a couple years older than he is, but uh, he was shining back in the late 70s and very early 80s as a middle distance runner and um, cross country runner. Uh, and I mean, you know, Eric and I were talking about it earlier uh, before the show. The, his list of accolades is so extensive that it's really almost hard to put a put a handle on the depth of this guy. I mean, what an amazing runner. Do you agree with me, Erica? Absolutely. It's so numerous. It just it, it, his accomplishments and uh, to this day records that he still holds and um, the numerous times he was on the U.S. teams representing. Uh, it's just. Yeah, you know, one 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 of those a person should have in their lifetime, you know, and feel proud. I, I just they're too numerous. Amazing! I can't wait to to hear from him. Yeah, it's amazing. It, it really is quite a quite an amazing thing. Let me let me just kind of while we're waiting to get him on the line, go through a couple of these. Great. Um, when he was in high school, um, let's see. He's, let's see, how did it go here? Uh, yeah, and I see there's so many. Where do you start, Richard? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> this fellow ran three miles in 13 minutes and 50 seconds and six-tenths of a second, okay? And that record still remains. He set that record in 1972, okay? Wow. Fast three miles I ever recorded in high school in the state of Illinois. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. His, uh, his uh, two-mile two mile record, he ran 840 to break Steve Prefontaine's national high school record rank. So this is the guy that beat Steve Pro, uh, Prefontaine back in the day. And I don't even know that a lot of people are aware of that. Uh, no. It just goes on. And this is just high school stuff, you know. 5,000 meters, 1358 in 1973. Um, this is just high school stuff. And I know. if you want to uh, look at um, some of the things he accomplished post um, school when he was out of college and s establishing world records, I mean, well, let me restate that. He was second to Henry Rono in the 10,000 meters in a world record. But right. it was the American uh, record in the 10,000 meters. And uh, he ran a 27.59. Let's see. And I don't, that doesn't even sound right. That's in the, pen, the 1979 Penn Relays. Um, God, there's just such a huge list of things here. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm probably looking at the same info you have. And I, here we go. It uh, is. At 1980, he set the American record of the 10,000 yep. meters at the time of 27.29. You know what? It takes me longer to to get out of bed <laughs> than that. Right. Yeah, and you know, 1981, he placed second in the Boston Marathon. Amazing. He ran a 2.10.2. I mean, just just amazing. Uh, I think he was the only American to win the World Cross Country Championships, and he won it twice. Um, just amazing stuff. And, uh, well, you know, can I can I say because yeah. you know some some people that you know you you mentioned that his name is you know that is not a household name. We all know Steve Prefontaine. Well, Meb, who I think we all know these days as being a very talented runner, you know, one of the one of the little factoids about Craig is that um, he held that ten thousand meter record for twenty four years, twenty four years from the Olympic trials. 
until right. Mev broke it in 2004. Who does that? Yeah, and That's you know, and what really, really I find to be unfortunate is that 10 days before the scheduled mm-hmm. 1980 Olympics, he mm-hmm. set the American record, and, uh, you know, I can imagine just he's going, I am going to go to the Olympics and crush this 10,000 meters. Absolutely. I am gold. You know, nobody's even in my caliber. And then we boycott the event, and he doesn't get a chance to go. I mean, that must have been just crushing for him. Uh. Not to mention the rest of the Olympic team. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, just a very uh, interesting story all around. Um, yeah. There's so many things that I want to talk to him about, aside from, you know, the obvious, the, the records he broke. What compelled me to seek him out to begin with was that I know, and at least I believed in my heart, I told him this, that given the time and the era that he was uh, competing it was before the heavy sold running shoe era. Right. Most everybody back in the day was running in a, a natural format shoe. I mean, right. you didn't have these really heavy airbags and gel bags and uh, this real right. you know, structured heel business underneath our running shoes back then. Right. And um, I just think that through this darkness that we went through, there's some 30 years of poor construction in my mind. My, that's me talking. Right. Um, we've been plagued with running injuries associated with heel striking and overstriding. And, um, you know, I, I, I kind of, it just occurred to me that it'd be interesting to speak with someone that came before then and get their take on what they think uh, the industry's right. been into and, uh, you know, try to draw that out and see um, right. what his opinion is on all of this. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to ruin it by, by you know, bleeding it out right now, but uh, we did, him and I <laughs> did speak about it briefly, and uh, he has, uh, I'm sure, much to share in that respect. Yeah. Um, and uh, as everybody should know by now that listens to our show, is that we are absolute advocates of uh, midfoot natural running styles. Right. And we believe wholeheartedly that getting uh, nearer to the ground in the type of shoe we wear is mm-hmm. the appropriate thing to do. Um, and, you know, every day I see more and more people come to realize that, in fact, this is the way to approach our running. And so mm-hmm. I'm very curious to, again, get his take on this. And I know, right. I believe he's doing some coaching. Um, and, again, okay. I apologize for not giving into the great depth of, of what he's up to, but I, I, I know that he's doing motivational speaking and he's traveling around and uh, sharing his story with, uh, you know, the corporate world and, and people that are looking right. for a, a bump in their, in their, uh, their mindset. Right. So, anyway, it, it's going to be a very, very, very interesting uh, conversation, I think. I, I agree. I agree. So, um, Erica, tell me, what have you been doing lately? Have you been doing any running? What have I been doing? Well, you know, it's funny. As I was listening to you speak and talking about midfoot and um, sneaker choice, uh, I ran into, you know, I, I don't know if our, our listeners were following, but the team that you and I had been working with, had their culminating race on Saturday, right? So I had run into a friend, actually, um, who was also registered for the race, and and he shot me a quick email after the race, and he said, Erica, he said, I have never, and this is kind of funny, Richard, he says, I have never seen anyone never heel strike for an entire 10 miles in a race, ever. (laughs) Really? And I said, yes, honest to goodness, I will forward it to you. Uh, and I and I said, well, I said, you know, I was not always a midfoot striker, but I said I will never be a heel striker again. <laughs> so it, you know, it, that's what I've been up to. But I just I wanted to go go back and, and bring that point up because I thought it was I had to kind of chuckle to myself. It, it and it goes you know hand in hand like you said about seeing more people doing the foot strike. I think people are when they're given the knowledge and the information. Um, it it just becomes a a natural thing, and I think there's longevity in running midfoot where there isn't in the in the heel heel strike. Erica, well, but, uh, um, well, 
while you're talking, I'm going to real quickly yeah. reach out and see if I can get him on the phone. Hang on. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to bore you, bore you guys out in the audience there with, uh, you know, my my philosophy on the, the midfoot and the heel strike, but um, I, I will bring it back to this fellow, Craig Virgin. When Richard told me he was bringing him on the show, I will admit, unfortunately, I was not familiar with him, and, and you can, or I can blame it on the fact that he's not from my era. I'm looking at these these years that he holds these records from, and, and um, they were either pre-me or <laughs> the year that I was born. Um, but nonetheless, uh, for whatever reason, I was not aware of his um, accomplishments, but absolutely numerous and amazing Richard had brought up his two-mile um, record hold was, if you do the math, it was uh, it was eight minutes and change. I think it was 840. Do the math. I mean, that's a simple one. That's like four-minute, 20-second miles. Absolutely unbelievable. That is flying around the track. And I can go for distances myself. Richard and I were talking about this earlier. I have never been a fast runner like that. It is absolutely unimaginable to me to move your feet that quickly, such fast turnover. Uh, It's it's crazy. And Richard also shared with me that this gentleman, Craig, blew a 92 on one of his VO2 tests. And and I didn't get a chance to ask Richard um, at what age, because obviously there's different factors that determine. I'll tell you what, Eric, let's, why don't we just go ahead and ask him? Um, I would love. love I want to. I want to introduce uh, Craig Virgin. As I said it earlier, clearly uh, an American running legend, one of the greatest oh. runners this country's ever produced, and we have the uh, the good fortune of having him here with us today. I want to introduce Craig to Erica Gratton, who is my co-host. And uh, could you say hello to Erica and the rest of the world for us, Craig? Good morning, Erica, and good morning to whoever the listening audience is out there. It's nice to be with you this morning. Good morning, Craig. Thank you so much for joining us. I am absolutely in awe of of your accomplishments and talent. I just uh, I cannot wait to hear from you. <laughs> well, Craig, I'm here, and I'm all yours in the audiences for the next 20 to 30 minutes, so fire away. Craig, I got a uh, – we, we kind of chimed in um, – right at the end of her comment about your VO2 score that I, I picked up on. I don't know oh where my. I... Oh, Where did you find that at? No, I, I don't even remember. But it, it, somewhere I picked up said you blew a 92 VO2. That is my highest. I routinely tested oh. 84 to 88. And um, <laughs> we discovered that in college the first time they ever put me on a treadmill with their requisite headgear and a pinched-off nose, which, of course, uh, is totally artificial. When you're running, you breathe through both your mouth and your nose. Heck, I could, I, I would have breathed through my ears if it would have allowed me to, <laughs> just to get more oxygen. <laughs> but, well, you um, know, Craig, you know, uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but that's pretty much my claim to fame is uh, I, I run a sports performance lab, and I do VO2 testing and have been for close to 20 years now. And I've tested a multitude of athletes um, from various sports. I used to work with the L.A. Kings and did the entire roster of uh, hockey players. Um, I've worked with professional uh, world champion boxers, and I've seen the whole gamut, uh, some professional cyclists, professional runners. Never in my life have I ever seen anywhere near a 90 in a VO2 score. Well, um, let me say, so you understand the credibility of the test, is I had one test by the exercise physiology department in college uh, at the University of Illinois, and it was shortly after I won the NCAA championships in 1975. I think it was later on that month of November. And uh, I think we hit 84 then. In fact, in that class, people tell me that they still, when they get to max VO testing and they still utilize my test scores and the whole values from that study in their classes today, 30 years later, I guess. But um, the rest of my testing was done down at Georgia State University uh, between, I think it was about 1982 and 84 with Dr. David Martin, who was an exercise physiologist, a Ph.D., And he did testing on a group with USA Track and Field back then. It was TAC, 
and also the USOC. And so it was very standardized. We used the same protocol, the same equipment, um, the same blood tester, you know, everything was the same for two years. And then Dr. Martin presented a paper on those findings. There was about six or eight of us that were tested uh, routinely. I was tested three or four times a year, roughly once a quarter. And uh, he presented a paper on that at the 84 Olympic Games in Los Angeles at that sports medicine symposium that always goes along with the Olympics. And, again, routinely 84 to 88, but that one time I did test at 92. But let me tell you this. Um, the other, you know, besides the max VO2, you're also looking for the anaerobic threshold. And what had started to happen by the time I hit that 92 was I was having a left knee issue that was causing me to get some imbalances. And um, my actual anaerobic threshold had fallen somewhat, even though my, ex, my max VO2 had gone up. And the only way that I can say that in a way that people out there would understand was that I had this fire-breathing engine, but I was having some gearing or sus suspension problems and getting that power to all four wheels. Yeah. And so that's kind of what happened. And while, um, you know, if I, I, I wish that I would have had some testing in 79, 80, and 81 when I did all my PRs because it, it would have been, I was ve I'm very curious to yeah. know just what I was hitting for a max VO2 when I was hitting my best performances. Unfortunately, the steady and routine testing didn't happen until about a year and a half or two years after that. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you, you've just touched on a, just a, a, a bushel full of things that <laughs> peak science because, um, you know, clearly... Well, that's what you want uh, in radio is you want uh, provocative guests, don't you? Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. Yeah, but see, what I'm, what I'm looking at is that, uh, you know, and I, I've written quite a bit on the, uh, the, the whole benefits of anaerobic threshold for training and where that is far more important to an individual's uh, training um, scenario than VO2. VO2, to me, gives me an indication of who I'm dealing with his anaerobic threshold is what I'm looking for uh, the most change from. And uh, I don't know, and, and I, I'm kind of getting out of, uh, out of balance with what I had hoped to approach you with, but since you brought it up, I, I, I'm now curious. i got to know. Well, Do let me you... say this. I, there was only one other athlete that tested as high or even close to what I did in our group of six or eight athletes, and Dr. Martin never told me who it was because of confidentiality back then, and I haven't spoken to him in several years, and I hope he would tell me the next time I speak to him, but I suspect that it was Pat Porter who lived and trained at Altitude. Um, uh, he was one of the people in the test, and I, if I had to pick a likely suspect, I would say that Pat Porter, because of his Altitude training and the fact that he had lived there for, what, six or eight years, probably um, was the guy that had that similar testing, or at least came close to what I did. Right. So well, my question is, is that have you ever used heart rate in your training? No. Uh, other than just the sense of, okay, I uh, I would go by effort base, and obviously effort uh, would have to do, you know, how, how I would gauge effort wasn't just how I felt. Remember, I was self-coached for a lot of my career. It wasn't just how I felt during the, during the interval or the workout, but it was how hard I was breathing. Uh, and, how, you know, and I, I never even checked my pulse, per se. Now, there is, I divide coaches into two camps. I divide them into the scientist camp and mm -hmm. then the artist camp. And the scientist camps are the people like Coach Hill and uh, who was that famous Nike uh, exercise physiologist that wrote that book. Um, you know, and they were all about treadmill testing and about max VO2 and usually those anaero uh, max VO2 oriented coaches relied heavily on long intervals uh, and certain um, threshold runs, they call that, because we didn't even have a threshold run name back when I was <laughs> doing my best running. We just, you know, nobody had even named it yet. You know, we just did certain right. workouts, and it just turned out that way. But And obviously I was doing something that was growing my max VO2, but I, anyhow, the artist coaches, on the other hand, well, the, excuse me, the scientist coaches use a lot of graphs, and, and Coach Hill is very famous for this. He's got charts and graphs, and that's how he determines certain paces and workouts and also how he makes projections 
about what an athlete's capability is. Whereas on the other hand, the artist coaches go on off of experience. They know the basic formulas, the basic ingredients, like a great chef. And they know what the things are that they have that they really need to work into the routine. But like a a good chef, it's not in stone from person to person. You kind of have to learn to modify the recipe slightly based on who you're working with and where you're working with and any other variables that may come in there. And I tended as a coach when I was coaching myself to fall much more under the artist coach and go by my gut, go by my experience since I had been coaching myself to some degree since high school. And I wish I could tell you that, well, I was checking my pulse rate or I had a, I had a, a, a heart rate monitor on, which would be the simplest way to do it nowadays, and I was gauging my workouts based on that. Nope, it was all in my mind, in my gut, and I would be thinking my way through my training, not only as I wrote it, but as I actually executed the workout. You know, and that's still, it's interesting, if, uh, just to share with you that uh, if you knew me better, you'd realize that I'm somewhere in between. Uh, I do, I preface most of my my uh, coaching relative to what I've learned in the lab, but I field test everything we do. And I, I'm very much outside the box when it comes to training because, as you pointed out, everybody's a unique individual, and the way their body responds to training is relative to their own physiology. So I use it as a guide. I don't use it as a hard line in, in where I take somebody. I might find that somebody that is not going to get their threshold to move because uh, no matter how much base running we do, they don't seem to improve. We've got to get some skill work in. We've got to get some, some more uh, articulate training going on. And I find that I, I start to break these plateaus when I start thinking outside the box. So I'm kind of in between. Well, but, at, my, uh, at my prime, um, I would take a break from my racing. My, my racing season would end in August usually or very early September in terms of both um, what I would do on the track in Europe because the season in track over there would start in June and would end in August, early September. So I would come back, and then I would take a month-long break. Uh, this is what I did most of the time during my best years. And then I would start my serious training as of October the 1st. And I would break my year up into four quarters. So I'd go October, November, December was the first quarter, and that was when I would try to develop a base and get my body used to doing some kill intervals and some fartlek, but I wasn't as time sensitive. Then I would break in January, February, and March. I would start to add more quality, more intensity, and I was much more time and performance conscious in January, February, and March, although I didn't have an indoor track, and so I had to work outside uh, uh, using the vagaries, well, adapting to the vagaries of the weather back here in southwestern Illinois, which is certainly better than northern Illinois where Chicago is, but we still had cold, we had wind, we had rain and uh, and snow and ice sometimes, and so I had to be very creative. But that, again, intensity, more attention to the times of the intervals or the times of the fartlek session or the time of the over-distance run, whether it was a recovery run or whether it was a hard-timed long run. And uh, that second quarter would end with the World Cross Country Championships in March, and also maybe the Crescent City Classic, which became a really uh, highly competitive 10K road race down in New Orleans that was world-class. And then my next quarter would be April, May, and June, where I would start to go to the track at least once a week in the beginning and then twice a week toward the end, and that part would end at the American Track and Field Championship and the Peachtree Road Race. And then the final quarter, which ended up only being two months, was basically July and August, which was that was my drop my mileage back, and it was intense, very fast racing on the track. So you can see how I segmented my year, and that there were certain priorities that I tried to achieve with each quarter, which I'm sure there's scientific reasons for that. I just did it because it was intuitive. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, absolutely. Now, so there's something that I'd love for you to 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 shed some light on because. Uh, you know, it seems to me th- there's a completely different um, uh, approach to training these days as opposed to what it was back in the day. And, again, uh, just to share with you, I, I, you know, I hate to cause myself to sound old, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm about, according to you, you're born in 55. I was born in 52. I'm about three years older than you. 
And okay. I think heart rate came around uh, really in the early 90s, like 90, I think 90, 1990, 91 is when heart rate started to uh, show up in the, in the the training world. But um, that's not where I was going. Where I was going with this is that I have athletes that I work with. I cannot get them to focus on a given event. They want to do 50 events a year. I got guys that are running marathons that are trying to run, I mean, literally uh, a marathon a month, and they they get stuck, they plateau, they can't seem to get the the times that they're looking for. I got people preparing for Boston, and you know they're trying to get under 2:30. And they're frustrated because no matter what they do, their times always end up in the same place. And I keep telling them that I want them to do no more than at maximum two races a year, marathon distance races per year, and then focus on their training. Would you agree with that thought theory? Yes. Uh, for the most part, let me just say, number one, and I'll say this out loud and shout it from the rooftops, <laughs> I think America is consumed with marathon mania right now, and it's at the point where it's totally unhealthy. Um, mm -hmm. There are people that just start running, and within three months, they want to say, well, I want to do a marathon now, okay? Because it's almost like um, either a half marathon or marathon, any event that has the word marathon in it, it's almost like mm -hmm. sex and sizzle. I mean, they don't think of themselves as a real runner unless they do a marathon. And the, the contra uh, two things that have contributed to this has been these charities that are engaging runners and tell them that if you will raise four or five thousand dollars for us, we will give you a personal trainer. And I say that with quotes around it because it really isn't, in my mind, and most of the time, what I would consider a personal trainer, uh, not in the reality. And, and 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 also they say you know we'll get you ready so that you can finish a marathon and we'll get it, and we'll get it all done in three or four or five months and for many people they have just started running and mm -hmm. I, I you know a lot of these people have no business doing a marathon yet and I would venture to say that some people have no business doing a marathon period you know if you want because biomechanically they have issues anatomically they have issues with a bad hip a bad knee. And I do not call, well, the second thing is an old buddy of mine named Jeff Galloway who wrote the books about running that is so popular for some people, you know, where minimal miles during the week and big miles on the weekends when you're not at work, it was aimed at adults that were working, is that, um, you know, he's now developed a program about jogging and walking and jogging and walking uh, alternately during your training so that you can finish the marathon. I am old school, and I do not call somebody that jogs two miles and walks one mile and does, does that again and again and again until they finish a marathon. I don't call them a marathoner. I call. I don't them love his book. Well, I got to be honest with you. I don't. I don't love his book. I think you're absolutely point on. Uh, I think that if you're going to run a marathon, you should be prepared to run a marathon, and that means that you have to train for it. And, and however you need long to train you that you can go the whole way with maybe stopping to take water or maybe stopping for one patch in the middle of a shake out a, a cramp or a, a side stitch or something. But if you're purposely going into the race to run two miles and then walk a mile, I, I don't, you know, I don't think, you know, I say, I, I say go back and run 5Ks, 10Ks, 8Ks, even 10-mile runs or races, but don't attempt the marathon until you work your way up to it. People treat the marathons with little or no respect nowadays, and I would rather see more of them that can train properly so they can finish between uh, three and a half and maybe five hours uh, and, and, and do it at that pace and not attempt it until they are capable of doing it at that pace. And then you know what the experience of a, of a true marathoner is and you know what the true preparation is because it isn't the result, it's the journey. And it's the journey that you go on for three or four or five months to get ready for that marathon and properly prepare for it, that is part of the satisfaction of the whole process. So Craig, I'll, get off my, I'll get off my soapbox now. No, no, <laughs> no, no. I, I'm, I love it. I'm, I could not be more in agreement. I, I'm glad you shouted it loud and proud. <laughs> well, Erica and Richard, I'm old school, and I know Richard and is is older than me. Erica, are you in my decade or are you younger? I'm younger, but but I cannot agree more that. It is. Uh, I am. I am nearly forty. 
So the okay. the gals that are that uh, I am I I say hang with loosely that are have children of the same age are are those folks that you're talking about. They are the ones that think I'm going to run a marathon. I'm going to run a half, and it has become so common um, that it it's put out there like anybody can do it. And you're right. It's, it's well, not a help. Good. I don't know whether or not how much of my background that you gave before I got on the air here with you, but I ran my first marathon at the end of seventy. No, at the beginning. Let's see. What did I do at the beginning of seventy nine? It was the Mission Bay Marathon, and uh, so it would have been probably January of 1979, and I ran a debut record at that point in time. It was two hours and 14 minutes, and I ran in San Diego at the old Mission Bay Marathon where you started at the old Padre Stadium and went down to Mission Bay, ran around it, and then came back up. And I ran it very conservatively, ran negative splits, really didn't start to get aggressive until the 13th or 14th mile, and then actually ran like about a 32-minute 10K, the last the last 10K. So obviously, and I look back on it now, and in my I ran Fukuoka the next, that next December so I could get a qualifying time for the Olympic trials in 1980 in case I wanted to do the 10K marathon double. And then I ran Boston in 81, and I ran 210-26, and that was my PR. And I, But you know what? I look back on that now, and I wish I had focused on the track or the shorter races because training for the marathon, and I only trained an 18-mile run, after mm-hmm. the first one, I did some 20-mile runs for the first one, but I only trained 18 miles because I found this abandoned railroad track where I could do most of that on dirt or, or gravel or both and could stay off the roads. And I just ended up doing that 18-mile run every 10, every 10 days, and that was the extent of my marathon training. So I really wasn't specific, specifically prepared for a marathon, but I do feel that it did hurt my short-distance speed on the track and in some ways, I wish I'd have stayed away from the marathon until after my third Olympics in '84, and just and then start to go for it when I was still capable of my fastest times on the track. Because we lose our speed as we age, and I, that would be my advice to the studs coming up right now and the studettes, is that mm-hmm. focus on your 10 mile on down PRs first until you get to be you know 24, 25, 26, and you're losing your speed and then you can start going for the marathon. The trouble is the marathon is the most commercially viable form of running today, and Mm -hmm. that's why the Africans have all gone toward it off the the track because the paydays are bigger, and there's so much marketability pressure from your sponsors to do a marathon because the exposure is bigger in this country. And to some degree, it has damaged our best American runners when they start to do the marathon too soon. Let me ask you a couple of questions about uh, the Africans, uh, and I want to segue into uh, what I originally uh, <laughs> uh, supposed to talk about was <laughs> I know back in the day, the old school running, when there was no heel formatted shoes in the running world, that the potential for knee injuries was probably less uh, collectively than there is today. And um, now that this whole thing's come full circle and we're starting to get back into more neutral format shoes and people are identifying the need and the, and the rationale for landing under center of mass and not overstriding and not heel striking, give me your two cents on all of that for me, if you could. Well, um, know this, that I, my first day of organized running was August the 3rd of 1969. It was the day after my 14th birthday, and I went out for cross country at my high school because of the encouragement of my eighth grade basketball coach who thought he spotted some ability. Um, I ran for the first two weeks in a pair of Chuck Taylor Converse All-Star high tops <laughs> that I used in basketball. And But I also need to tell you that that first week or two of training, we were mainly on a grass field or out at a park where a lot of it was grass, and we hadn't done high miles. I didn't, and we I got a pair of spikes and a pair of flats eventually, but um, they were not very good, and uh, it wasn't until that winter that I owe it to a, um, a coach in a nearby school that got me connected with Dick Pond Sporting Goods up in Chicago, who was really one of the first pioneers in the mail-order business, that I got some Anatsuka Tiger shoes, and I got my first pair of shoes 
that were light, that were cushioned, that were that had you know that were made for it. Now, what's happened in the, from the early 70s until today, so roughly 40 years, you know, 40 plus years of running, is that I saw the shoe companies go from kind of lightweight, flimsy um, shoes that didn't have enough protection or enough control which is at one end of the spectrum, all the way to the point where I think in the last 10 or 15 years we've gotten overprotective shoes and over-controlling shoes, and the features on the shoes as they try to do more and more with each shoe design I think have caused as many issues as they have prevented. And so I, I do not agree with the barefoot or very minimum uh, running shoes that some theories espouse today. I think it's faddish, and I think ultimately it will be proven to be dangerous for more people than not, unless you're spoiled enough where you can run on grass. If you live by a golf course, you can go out and run all of your miles or 90% of them on grass, and I think you'll be okay. Otherwise, I think you need more of a neutral shoe in terms of correction, either pronation or supination, and it needs to be um, in the middle between the highly padded lifted shoes with the rear heel and and then the shoes that are completely at the bottom. Most of us have heels on the rest of our shoes. So I think that we need a slight heel lift, but nothing of the sort of like some of the running flats have gone to where you almost feel like you're running around in a pair of um, Elton John <laughs> Elton John flip on loafers from the 70s and 80s, you know, which is almost like platform shoes. I, I, I feel that we've gone too far and we need to get back in the middle, and I think it would be helpful to more people. In terms of if you truly do need correction because you have excessive supination or excessive pronation, my first advice is to purchase a relatively inexpensive insert uh, at a running store or at a really high quality, you know, pharmacy and try that first to see if you can get any relief. And if that doesn't work, then by all means get to a podiatrist where they can do an analysis on your foot and give you a prescription for um, a, a motion control orthotic that is de designed just for you and not designed for the masses, okay? And if you get that, then there's a better chance that you will escape injury and or prevent injuries and also have better performance. But the orthotics have changed a great deal, Erica and Richard, because in college, when I first tried one, they were like acrylic, okay, very rigid. And I learned rapidly that they were very uncomfortable and they interfere with my running. And what I like today is the slightly more flexible orthotics, if you need one, that give a little bit uh, in terms of the impact and also as you bend forward on the foot, they're not entirely rigid. They do give just a little bit. Now, that's I'm not a doctor, and I don't play one on TV, but I've run for over 40 years, and that would be my best advice based on experience. Well, i gotta, I got I to gotta differ with you on a couple of counts. Uh, okay, first of all, go ahead. Uh, you know, in my lab, I do gait analysis where I do video analysis forward, sideways, backwards, slow motion analysis, looking for sure. issues with gait analysis. Uh, and uh, I could tell you that more often than not, the people that have been plagued with a lot of the knee injuries that I see and plantar fasciitis and issues with the Achilles uh, commonly are overprescribed where orthotics are concerned. And the, the, the fact remains that the problem resides in the fact that they land on their heel first. When you land on your heel, you see more late-stage pronation, and you have a lot of more issues with supination pronation, as you suggested, and then if you're going to be landing on your heel, then you have stability issues, and, and the formats that these podiatrists prescribe are typically appropriate. Fact okay, of the matter, well, let, me, let, me, let me interfere, interrupt one thing and just sure. say this. There aren't, I, I find a real smattering of quality in terms of podiatrists and prescriptions, and there are podiatrists and there are podiatrists for runners. And I, I think that there's only a few around the country that are what I would consider really, really good podiatrists for runners. And I would think that most people could get by with without an orthotic. I think orthotics may be appropriate for less than a third of the running population, maybe even less than that. And if you want to get into foot plant, I totally agree with you that a midfoot landing, you know, we didn't ask, you didn't ask that, okay? And I realize that orthotics come into play more because of the motion from the heel to the forefoot when you walk especially, 
but when you're running, I do I do agree with you that it should be in most cases much more of a mid foot strike so that you can get to the front of the foot. I feel it's more stable. It probably means that you're landing underneath your center of gravity in term, instead of in front of you, and there may be better shock absorption with your legs when you land that way. And certainly, from a performance standpoint, it allows you to get to the front of your foot easier and push off, which automatically means that you're going to be running faster. No Does doubt that help about it. at all? No, you're absolutely right, and I, I think that we're clear on that, uh, the, and I agree with you. Um, it's just that, I, I, unfortunately, what I've seen, and, and there, you're, you're probably right, there's, there's some guys out there that work with runners primarily, and they get it. But I tell you what, locally, I've found nothing but issues with people coming in here, and they're, they're offering prescription where they haven't ever looked at the kid running. I work with kids, yes. too, and they're giving these kids these, these boots to run in, and just over, uh, just uh, uh, dominating the natural function of the foot, and then the foot. Well, there, and there are also orthopedic surgeons that operate too much. Okay, uh, that's because that's what they do, and that's what they get paid for. And I think uh, podiatrists can often fall into that mode of, okay, you're coming in, you expect to get something. I'll look at your foot. I'll see if I can see you on the exam table and see you stand on your foot. But you're exactly right. You really need to see someone move. You need to see them walk, coming and going, and you need to see them run. And a treadmill is helpful, but even a treadmill, for, unless you're really used to running on a treadmill, I, I, I prefer to actually see what somebody does outside, and it almost requires me to run with them or bicycle with them and kind of watch them from behind and watch them from the side for me to do a and, – and not just, you know, for a few seconds here, but actually after they get tired – and after we've talked for a while, and I know that they're not thinking about it, that, that where it's coming from is natural and not contrived. Does that make any sense at all? Absolutely. Erica, I'm going to let you yes. tell them. Tell, tell yes. them about the bike, Erica. How do I coach my <laughs> athlete? Exactly. I was smiling while he was talking. That's, that's and, I, and, and the listeners don't even know. I don't know you guys from Adam because... I just met you online just a few days ago. So <laughs> I, I will get on my bicycle. I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got a cruiser bike with a little bell on it. And what I do is when we're road running and we're training, I have my athletes out on the road running. I sneak up on them on my bike. They can't hear me. I've got these big, fat tires. They can't even hear me right. coming. And I observe them from behind. And, and then I'll start ringing my bell when I get up on them. And then I get up on their side, and then I guide them through the appropriate running stride that I'm looking for time them with GPS, and uh, I look at their heart rate, I look at their stride rate, I look at their cadence, and uh, at their race pace, I'm at their shoulder talking them through what I want them to do. And they, when they hear that bell, it's like they go, oh, hell, he's back. <laughs> but, you know, I can't sit on the side of the track and help anybody, and I can't get a good look at it. And I video uh, uh, live, too. I'll video them while they're running. I do it from my car. So well, can, it, do you agree with me that the treadmill can present an artificial environment that alters a lot of people's form? Yeah, I initiated early on so that I'm able to get a closer and more precise video analysis, but I always follow up with field testing, whether it be for, for the heart rate information or whether it be for just, you know, you, first of all, you can't lean on a treadmill. So right. uh, if, if you're trying to get a forward lean into your run, you're trying to let inertia get at your back, you can't do it on yep. a treadmill. So I always take them outside where we're doing gate work. Well, and so I think you and I would probably get along right. You, you actually, you know what, when you're trying to find the truth and you're trying to get to the bottom of an issue, you really have to look at any issue from several different directions. And while the videotaping on the treadmill is helpful, um, I don't think you can put 100% of your judgment based on that. That's why I agree with you that you need to get outside with the athletes and either follow them around the track during certain workouts or go out on the roads with them and watch them, especially they need to not be aware that you're there. So I totally agree with your stealth approach. You need to have them run while they're relaxed, while they're thinking about something else, and that way you see the truth and the reality without them mentally interfering with their cadence. And you bust them. Then you bust them, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 now the other thing is that you can immediately give them some, tech, uh, some biomechanical suggestions you know, about, well, you know, raise your arms a little bit, lean a little bit farther forward from your hips, and they can try it right there while you're watching. 
and you can say, okay, that looks a lot better, you know. So um, you can bust your chops, but you can also try to say, okay, let's try this because this doesn't look right. And I would love to attend one of your training sessions sometime. Well, well, I would love to have you, Craig. Uh, let, let's can I get real back? Uh, let's get off this for a second. I mean, this has been fun with this, but I want to get back to your career. And there's a couple of things that I think that are very worth noting. And first of all, I, I've learned that you know, coming up, you had some issues. You you had a congenital uh, disorder that was getting in your way. Um, you, you were wrestling with some some illnesses that uh, it's just surprising to me that you were able to achieve so much with so much that you had to fight with. And I'd imagine that's part and parcel why you're, you're becoming such a great motivational speaker. Well, um, most people, when they think of, when, when they hear the title three-time Olympian, two-time World Cross Country Champion, they probably think of a perfect physical specimen. And I was far from that. Um, as you touched on, at the age of five, I was I came home from kindergarten very sick. Uh, I had, you know, just like that one Michael Landon movie, I had been a bedwetter, and my mom, who was graduated from Washington University, had gone to libraries to say, you know, why is my son wetting his bed? Um, you know, he's having these issues, and most people would say, oh, it's all in his mind. Well, <laughs> they, you know, they just didn't have me tested. We found out at the age of five when they thought I had appendicitis. They had me on the operating table, and one doctor said, you know, there's a couple of symptoms here that don't add up. Let's do one more test. And that's when they found out that I had a raging urological infection. And I had a megalo ureter, which means I was basically back flushing from my bladder back up to my kidneys, and I was poisoning myself. And the first, re the first reconstructive surgery at age five um, failed within six months miserably, and the doctors that I, were treating me told my parents that I probably wouldn't live to be a teenager. And they said that's all they could do, and, they sh and so my parents shot me around, and thankfully I live not far from St. Louis, which has a lot, uh, has two big teaching hospitals, St. Louis University and also Washington University, and we found one urologist that had had a patient similar to me in terms of the symptoms and the, and the uh, diagnosis, and he had kept her alive. And so he took me on from the age of five to the age of 13. And basically, I had to learn to monitor my body. He said, look, if you're going to live, you're going to have to be a part of this management, and you're going to have to tell us when you feel certain symptoms, because that means that the infection in your body, which will always be present, will go from just glowing embers to a, a raging forest fire. And you've got to give us these hints that you're feeling certain symptoms so that we can get you in and off of oral antibiotics and on to intravenous antibiotics. And this, plus they had to test me with, uh, I think it's called an IVT, every four to six months. And um, I had to go through a lot of that, and, and that taught me to lear learn to listen to my body on yeah. one hand. And at the other hand, when I had to go through the painful IVPs, it taught me to disassociate from my body, to get away from the pain and take my mind to another place. Well, also remember this. I was like a white Kenyan. I grew up on a farm, and my dad farmed mm -hmm. 900 acres, and, and uh, we had livestock, and we had crops, and I had to do a lot of uncomfortable work that was borderline painful, uh, either in the heat of the winter or the, I mean, the heat of the summer or the depths of the cold winter, and I had to learn to get the job done through discomfort and almost borderline pain then, too. And so I guess all those things added up to the fact that God gave me a natural ability, but also my life and the experiences in my childhood taught me to learn to listen and read my body as well as learn how to ignore it better than what I would consider the average kid, you know, 14 years old when I started running. So um, it's kind of an interesting sidebar story, and it, it might explain why, I mean, most people... I would be willing to venture that there's very, very few champion athletes in the last 20 years that I competed against that had the obstacles health-wise and physical-wise that I had to overcome. Now, did I mention the fact that I was pigeon-toed and I had to have correction, corrective shoes? <laughs> and, you know what? You know, at one point in time in, in junior high when you're at your most, your least confident and uh, I had I had glasses on. I had I just had to wear glasses. I had acne. I had braces, and I had corrective shoes. And then at one point in time, for two months, I had to wear a leg bag to drain my bladder after that second surgery. I felt so sexy; it was unbelievable. <laughs> you know what's funny, Craig, is that uh, the, the image that I have of you that I got off the internet. 
um, you know, to give you uh, how how weird I am, is uh, I could <laughs> see that you, you were towing in with your right foot while you were running on the track. Uh, I picked up on it. I didn't know that you were pigeon toed, but I could definitely uh, see that you you had a tendency to invert with your your running stride. Well, um, I'd have to identify the picture with you. I I think that uh, I definitely didn't. Well. When I look at my tracks in the snow, you know, and or in the sand, whenever I did that, I guess I always tried to run not splay-footed to the outside and not pigeon-toed to the inside, but run slightly neutral, and which is you know, kind of straight ahead because maybe a slight out just slightly so that I could roll forward off the first and second metatarsals and push off as quickly as possible. Uh, because you know the way you run fast is to stay off the ground as much as possible and to get the the big the biggest stride that you can do and still maintain your turnover and not overstride. But I have no idea. But you know I wore corrective shoes from like the fourth grade to the eighth grade. So for five or six critical years, I wore these corrective shoes because I was pigeon toed, and uh, they were special made for me by a store over in um, in St. Louis. Um, so it, it and it may have done something. Now let me make one other mention. I learned I stumbled on something completely accidental. My co- my high school coach had only been coaching for two years before I came along, and he had no background in running himself. He was a baseball basketball player, and he had taken some swim. Uh, he took some master's degree courses at Indiana University, and his teacher was Doc Councilman, the famous swim coach who coached Mark Spitz and just a long line of Olympians from Indiana University back when they were a hotbed for swimming. And he, so a lot of the principles of training a swimmer are similar to running. But other than that, I was on my own. And I, by the time I was a sophomore, stumbled onto the thing of trying to do negative splits in my interval, you know, where I start out at a certain pace and I try to get faster as the workout goes on instead of slower. Well, you know, you can't gut it out the whole workout. And so what I learned for the, you know, the first third of the workout, I would get faster just because I got looser and, you know, I got relaxed and I would just warm up, okay? The middle third, I would try to get faster by making biomechanical adjustments, uh, trying to find the right lean with my chest, my chin, the right angle of my neck, the right, the right stature with my shoulders, the right... Um, angle that my hands would come across my side and up to my chest, I would make little adjustments. And then finally, most importantly, the right way that my foot would contact the ground. So I would keep altering my biomechanics and fine-tuning this and that just to find out what would give me another half a second faster for that same quarter mile without digging deep in my tank and taking me all the way down. Now, I counted on the last third of the workout, being exhausted, and I would have to go to my guts and my heart and my mind then. And if you do it right, that's the way it's supposed to. But if you're reaching that point in the middle of the workout, you're you're going to overtrain and you're not going to make it to the end of the workout with your goal time. So I learned as a sophomore and junior in high school to adjust my biomechanics in search of that elusive um, inertia, you know, where just the right lean, where almost you were falling forward, and it kept you going forward without a lot of energy. Does that does that um, does that strike a chord at all with you, Richard? It resonates with me. Okay. Uh, listen, Craig, we've got about uh, three four minutes left. Um, I want to real quickly ask you this, and uh, I know this is probably a, a a topic for another forty five minutes for the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, feeding into the nineteen eighty Olympics, knowing that you just set an American world record or American record in the ten thousand meters, it must have been a, a big deflation for you to find out that we boycotted that event. Well, no, that's kind of a I big. Won, ask you to, I to, won the World Cross Country <laughs> Championships in March, and in the press conference, that I was the first American man ever to do that. I did it in Paris, um, and um, but the rumors of the potential Moscow Olympic boycott by President Carter and our State Department had been around for a couple of months, and they did ask me questions. And of course, I said, "Well, I, you know, I can't imagine doing that. I hope that we can't, and I hope the cooler minds will prevail." And I said, "I, you know, my goal is after being in Montreal in '76. Obviously, I'm improving." 
I just won the world championships, and my goal is to try to get to Moscow and try to win a medal in the 10,000 meters and be the first American to do that since Billy Mills. And uh, But over the next two or three months, the, the drumbeat got louder, and by the mm. time I actually went to the trials, um, we knew that it was probably an 80% probability that we would not be going. It is a true credit to all the athletes involved in the trials in 1980 that you saw some fantastic performances and there were efforts and records set like mine in that 10,000 that, that day that, you know, my record lasted in the Olympic trials 10,000 for 20, for 24 years until Meb Kofusky broke it. And, um, I tried, you know, I, I guess, you know, within a week or two of the trial, it became obvious that there wasn't going to be a change in mind. And I had, I either could let that destroy me mentally or I had to just reset my goals and and say, okay, you know, sometimes this world isn't fair and sometimes things happen that are completely outside of our control. And that's what I did to try to maintain some sanity. And I just went, simply went back to the track in Europe after the Olympics were over to try to reclaim, uh, you know, wh- where I rightfully should have been during that games. And, you know, a lot of athletes, some of them reacted poorly, some of them reacted okay. Uh, it destroyed some athletes mentally, and they lost their desire. I can only say this, Richard and Erica, I hope that America never, ever again entertains the idea of boycotting the Olympic Games. It's totally counterproductive. It's counter to what the Olympics stand for. It's counter to what we have to gain from the Olympics, and it will hurt the athletes and hurt the Olympic movement for years. No, uh, I think that's a perfect place to, to, to carry this to a conclusion. Craig, I hope that one day we meet. I hope that we'll get a chance to get you back on the show. You have so much to share with the audience, and we yes. uh, loved having you. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank I want to know what part of California do you guys are you guys located in, southern or central? Southern California. We're a little north of Los Angeles by about 60 miles. On the way to Santa Barbara. Okay. Well, very good. I hope I'll run into both of you, and thank you, Erica and Richard, for having me on the show this morning. And thank you. Thanks, Craig. Pleasure. So, Erica, you want to say good? Any parting thoughts? we got about uh, 10 seconds. Oh, gosh. Yeah, um, no, not that I can fit into 10 seconds. Just an absolute <laughs> pleasure listening to him, and, and I would agree that he is who he is because of his, his childhood experiences and um, Well, friends, strength. it's time again to close Great. our show till next week. <laughs> On behalf of our staff and the community of members, I want to thank you for allowing us into your world. To learn more about us, we invite you to visit us at the naturalrunningnetwork.com. And if you join us as a prospect member, which is the best way to get access to all of the services that we've come to enjoy, is to let us know who and where you are. We, in turn, will reach out to you when we have a coach or an event in your area. Our goal is to spread the Natural Running Network across the country and eventually the world. So don't be surprised if one day you learn that we're right in your neighborhood providing services, coaching, and training opportunities that we've come to appreciate. And until next week, thank you for listening, and you have an amazing day. Blog Talk Radio, where millions of hosts and listeners gather. Okay, and that record still remains. So you set that record in 1972. Okay, wow. fastest three miles I ever recorded in high school in the state of Illinois. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. His, uh, his uh, two, mi- two mile record, he ran 840 to break Steve Prefontaine's national high school record rank. So. This is the guy that beat Steve Prefontaine back in the day. And I don't even know that a lot of people are aware of that. Uh, 
this goes on, and this is just high school stuff, you know. 5,000 meters, 1358 in 1973. Um, this is just high school stuff. And I know. if you want to uh, look at um, some of the things he accomplished post um, school when he was out of college and s establishing world records, I mean, well, let me restate that. He was second to Henry Rono in the 10,000 meters in a world record. But right. it was the American uh, record in the 10,000 meters. And uh, he ran a 27.59. Let's see. And I don't, that doesn't even sound right. That's in the, pen, the 1979 Penn Relays. Um, God, there's just such a huge list of things here. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm probably looking at the same info you have. And I, here we go. It uh, is. 1980, he set the American record of the 10,000 yep. meters at the time of 27.29. You know what? It takes me longer to to get out of bed <laughs> than that. Right. Yeah, exactly. and you know, 1981, he placed second in the Boston Marathon. Amazing. He ran a 2.10.2. I mean, just just amazing. Uh, I think he was the only American to win the World Cross Country Championships, and he won it twice. Um, just amazing stuff. And uh, well, you know. Can I can I say because yeah. you know some some people that you know you you mentioned that his name is you know that it's not a household name we all know Steve Prefontaine well Meb who I think we all know these right? uh, and uh, you know I'm not going to ruin it by by you know bleeding it out right now but uh, we did him and I <laughs> did speak about it briefly and uh, he has uh, I'm sure much to share in that respect yeah. Um, and as everybody should know by now that listens to our show, is that we are absolute advocates of uh, midfoot natural running styles. Right. And we believe wholeheartedly that getting uh, nearer to the ground in the type of shoe we wear is mm -hmm. the appropriate thing to do. Um, and, you know, every day I see more and more people come to realize that, in fact, this is the way to approach our running. And so I'm very curious to, again, get his take on this. And I know, right. I believe he's doing some coaching. Um, and, again, okay. I apologize for not giving into the great depth of, of what he's up to. But I, I, I know that he's doing motivational speaking and he's traveling around and uh, sharing his story with, uh, you know, the corporate world and, and people that are looking right. for a, a bump in their, in their, uh, their mindset. Right. So anyway, it, it's going to be a very, very, very interesting uh, conversation, I think. I, I agree. I agree. So, um, Erica, tell me, what have you been doing lately? Have you been doing any running? What have I been doing? Well, you know, it's funny. As I was listening to you speak and talking about midfoot and um, sneaker choice, uh, I ran into, you know, I, I don't know if our, our listeners were following, but the team that you and I had been working with, had their culminating race on Saturday, right? So I had run into a friend, actually, um, who was also registered for the race, and, and he shot me a quick email after the race, and he said, Erica, he said, I have never, and this is kind of funny, Richard, he says, I have never seen anyone never heel strike for an entire 10 miles in a race, ever. <laughs> really? And I said, yes, honest to goodness, I will forward it to you. Uh, and I and I said, well, I said, you know, I was not always a midfoot striker, but I said I will never be a heel striker again. <laughs> so it, you know, it, that's what I've been up to. But I just I wanted to go go back and, and bring that point up because I thought it was I had to kind of chuckle to myself. It, it and it goes you know hand in hand like you said about seeing more people doing the foot strike. I think people are when they're given the knowledge and the information. Um, it it just becomes a a natural thing, and I think there's longevity in running midfoot where there isn't in the in the heel heel strike. Erica, while well, uh, um, well, while you're talking, I'm going to real quickly yeah. reach out and see if I can get him on the phone. Hang on. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to bore you, bore you guys out in the audience there with uh, you know my my philosophy on the, the midfoot and the heel strike, but um, I, I will bring it back to this fellow, Craig Virgin. When Richard told me he was bringing him on the show, 
I, I will admit, unfortunately, I was not familiar with him, and, and you, you can, or I can blame it on the fact that he's not from my era. I'm looking at these these years that he holds these records from, and, and um, they were either pre-me or <laughs> the year that I was born. Um, but nonetheless, uh, for whatever reason, I was not aware of his um, accomplishments, but absolutely numerous and amazing Richard had brought up his two-mile um, record hold was, if you do the math, it was uh, it was eight minutes and change. I think it was 8.40. Do the math. I mean, that's a simple one. That's like four-minute, 20-second miles. Absolutely unbelievable. That is flying around the track. And I can go for distances myself. Richard and I were talking about this earlier. I have never been a fast runner like that. It is absolutely unimaginable to me to move your feet that quickly, such fast turnover. Uh, it's it's crazy. And Richard also shared with me that this gentleman, Craig, blew a 92 on one of his VO2 tests. And I didn't get a chance to ask Richard um, at what age, because obviously there's different factors that determine. Well, well, I'll tell you what, Eric, let's, why don't we just go yeah. ahead and ask him. Um, I, I would love. love I, want to. To, I want to introduce uh, Craig Virgin. He's just being a very talented runner. You know, one of the, one of the little factoids about Craig is that um, he held that 10,000-meter record for 24 years, 24 years from the Olympic trials until yeah. Med broke it in 2004. Who does that? Yeah, and, That's you know, and what really, really I find to be unfortunate is that 10 days before the scheduled mm-hmm. 1980 Olympics, he mm-hmm. – that's the American record, and uh, you know I can imagine just he's going. I am going to go to the Olympics and crush this ten thousand meters. Absolutely. I am old, you know nobody's even in my caliber, and then we boycott the event, and he doesn't get a chance to go. I mean that must have been just crushing for him. Uh, not to mention the rest of the Olympic team. Yeah. So yeah. Um, just a very uh, interesting story all around. Um, there's so many things that I want to talk to him about, aside from, you know, the obvious, the, the records he broke. What compelled me to seek him out to begin with was that I know, and at least I believed in my heart, I told him this, that given the time and the era that he was uh, competing, it was before the heavy sole running shoe era. Right. Most everybody back in the day was running in a, a natural format shoe. I mean, right. he didn't have these really heavy airbags and gel bags and uh, this real you know, structured heel business underneath our running shoes back then. Right. And um, I just think that through this darkness that we went through, there's some 30 years of poor construction in my mind. My, that's me talking. Right. Um, we've been plagued with running injuries associated with heel striking and overstriding. And, um, you know, I, I, I kind of, it just occurred to me that it'd be interesting to speak with someone that came before then and get their take on what they think uh, the industry's right. been into and, uh, you know, try to draw that out and see. Um, right what his opinion is on all of this. Blog Talk Radio, the world's largest online radio network. Say good morning to the world, Erica Gratton. Good morning, world. <laughs> it's morning for us, and um, our guest is just getting ready to get into his afternoon soon. Uh, today, I hope to have a wonderful show. I have some very, very uh, interesting stuff going on. Um, we're going to interview Craig Virgin. Uh, what I would like to refer to is an American running legend, one of the greatest runners that ever came down the pipe in the United States. Um, you know, he, the beauty of this guy is, you know, first of all, I guess first and foremost is that we come from the same era. Actually, I'm a couple years older than he is, but uh, he was shining back in the late 70s and very early 80s as a middle distance runner and um, cross country runner, uh, and I mean, you know, Eric and I were talking about it earlier uh, before the show. 
the, his list of accolades is so extensive that it's really almost hard to put a put a handle on the depth of this guy. I mean, what an amazing runner. Do you agree with me, Erica? Absolutely. It's so numerous. It just it, it, his accomplishments and uh, to this day, records that he still holds and um, the numerous times he was on the U.S. teams representing, uh, it's just, uh, you know, one, one, one of those a person should have in their lifetime, you know, and feel proud. I, I just, they're too numerous. Amazing. I can't wait to, to hear from him. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's, uh... It, it really is quite a quite an amazing thing. Let me let me just kind of while we're waiting to get him on the line, go through a couple of these. Um, when he was in high school, um, let's see. He let's see how did it go here. Uh, yeah, and I see there's so many. Where do you start, Richard? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> this fellow ran three miles. In 13 minutes and 50 seconds and six tenths of a second. Okay.